Welcome to the Northbound Wealth Podcast. All opinions expressed by me, my co-hosts, or my guests are solely our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Northbound Wealth Management. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended as personalized recommendations or fiduciary advice. It is not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for any investment, accounting, legal, and tax advice or as a solicitation to offer or buy any securities. Clients of Northbound Wealth Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hey everyone, this is Brent Foster. Today is December 11th, 2023. This is the 63rd episode of the Northbound Wealth Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and listening every week or week and a half. It's been a fun year. We're barreling in on the end of the year. We probably have one more podcast release before the end of this year, and then we'll return in the middle of January after the turn of the year and Christmas break, New Year's break winter break, and uh, a lot of reflection on what happened in 2023 and what's ahead for 2024. So here we go. Uh, A late week two-day rally left stocks higher, adding to November's gains as the last month of trading for 2023 began. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was flat at 0.01%, while the S&P 500 gained 0.21%. The NASDAQ Composite Index advanced 0.69% for the week. The MSCI EFA Index, which tracks developed overseas stock markets, rose and was up 0.37%. What does that mean for the Dow? The Dow Jones closed last week at 36,247 and change. The year to date, that's up 9.35%. The NASDAQ closed at 14,403. That's up 37.62%. MSCI EFA closed at 2,138. That's up about 10% for the year. And the S&P 500 closed at 4,604 uh, at 19.92% up on the year. The 10-year Treasury note uh, rallied. Actually, it was, it was uh, down to 4.23%, down from 5%. Uh, earlier this year, and that kind of signals a rally in bonds prices and also for the markets, a year-to-date 0.35% for the 10-year Treasury note. So what happened last week? Stocks extend gains. The relationship between the bond and the stock markets, which pushed stocks higher in November, uh, for example, falling bond yields, rising stock prices, which I just described, disappeared last week, with stocks falling in the first three days of the week, despite declining yields. Interesting, yields dropped following a weak jobs opening report or jolts report, the ADP unemployment update and the and substantial uh, productivity, productivity revision. On Thursday, investor enthusiasm returned with force on artificial intelligence related news or AI news. One AI chip manufacturer announced a new AI chip followed by a mega cap tech company unveiling an enhanced version of its AI model for business use. Stocks continued their climb on Friday despite rising yields as investors viewed a stronger than expected employment report as increasing the potential for a soft landing. Productivity surged. Higher productivity may be the most effective and preferred way to reduce inflation. Last week's revised third quarter productivity report saw an upward revision of the annualized productivity growth from the initial report of 4.7% to 5.2%. This was welcome news on the inflation front and an encouraging development for future corporate profits. The 5.2% jump in productivity represented the fastest pace since the third quarter of 2020. The report also showed unit labor costs falling at a 1.2% annualized pace, reflecting a cooling of wage growth inflation on inflationary pressures. Productivity has increased for two straight quarters, potentially allowing the Fed to ease its restrictive monetary policy. So this week, what we're looking at is uh, a Fed meeting and minutes being released. Uh, So we're going to be following a lot of that and reporting back to you after the fact on our next podcast. So key economic data this week, Tuesday, consumer price index, Wednesday, the PPI report, FOMC announcement, which I just mentioned, Thursday, retail sales, jobless claims, Friday, industrial production, Purchasing Managers Index or PMI Flash Composite report. 
All right. This week, companies reporting earnings, the notable ones. Not all of them. There's just too many to list. So Wednesday, Adobe. Thursday, Costco, which who doesn't love Costco? Friday, Lennar Corporation, which will give us some insight into how the housing market's doing. All right. Tax tip of the week. So tax tips for children or grandchildren with part-time jobs. Many of us have kids or grandkids who work part-time, whether they're busing tables, working in a shop or other jobs. These tips may help them and you understand the tax implications of part-time jobs. So withholdings. If your child is working for an employer, they will generally withhold taxes from their paycheck. If they are self-employed, however, they may be responsible for paying these taxes directly uh, to the IRS. Self-employment. It's a good idea to keep records of income, expenses related to self-employment work. Expenses associated with self-employment may be deductible. New employee paperwork. Talk to your child or grandchild about the paperwork they may need to fill out when they're starting a new job. This will likely include a W-4, which is a form that businesses use to calculate how much federal income should be withheld from their paycheck. Tip income. This one's a sticky one. All tip income is taxable. Did you hear that? And if they make more than $20 in cash tips a month, they must report it to their employer. In addition, they must report all yearly tips on their tax returns. Payroll taxes. Even if your kids or grandkids earn too little to owe income tax, they still may have to either pay Social Security and Medicare taxes themselves or have them withheld from their paycheck. This information is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized tax advice. We suggest you discuss your specific tax issues with a qualified tax professional. And this tip was adapted from irs.gov. All right, on to the next segment. This will be interesting. We're going to discuss the S&P price targets for 2024. Stay tuned. John Butters is the Vice President and Senior Earnings Analyst at FactSet. His weekly research report, Earnings Insight, provides analysis and commentary on trends in corporate earnings data for the S&P 500, including revisions to estimates, year-over-year growth, performance relative to expectations, and valuations. He is a widely used source for the media and has appeared on CNBC, Fox Business News, and the Business News Network. In addition, he has been cited by numerous print and online publications such as the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Times, Market Watch, and Yahoo Finance. Mr. Butters has over 15 years of experience in the financial services industry. Prior to FactSet in January 2011, he worked for more than 10 years at Thomson Reuters, uh, which is Thomson Financial most recently as a director of U.S. Earnings Research 2007 to 2010. So uh, this guy puts out insights, love it, uh, thought it was worth discussing on the podcast, given that we're going to talk about this very thing. Industry analysts predict the S&P 500 will close above 5,000 in 2024. So with 2023 coming to a close, analysts are making predictions for the closing price of the S&P 500 for next year. These predictions vary widely as market strategists, typically using top-down approach, are divided as to whether the S&P 500 will close above or below 5,000 at the end of 2024. Where do industry analysts using the bottoms-up approach believe the S&P 500 will close at the end of 2024? a good question. So he covers that in his article, industry analysts in aggregate predict that the S&P 500 will have a closing price of 5,068 spot 41 in 12 months. This bottom up target price for the index is calculated by aggregating the median target price estimates. So that's based on the company level target prices submitted by industry analysts for all the companies in the index. On December 7th, the bottom up target price for the S&P 500 was 5,068 spot 41, which was 10.5% above the closing price of 4,585 spot 59. So of the S&P 500 closing on that particular day at 4,585 and change, uh, 10% 
ten and a half percent move north or up would be five thousand sixty eight spot forty one, which is the closing price target for what analysts predict will happen for the 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 end of twenty twenty four. At the sector level, the energy sector is expected to see the largest price increase at twenty six point. 1%. So as an aside, I would like to say that the energy sector and the financial sector didn't do well in 2023 compared to all the other sectors in the S&P 500. So it would be obvious that it has the most room to run for next year, especially if there's a reversion back to a broadening out of buying of say small and mid-cap companies as well as sectors that were distressed in 2023 and a really good year in the market. So on the other hand, let's get back to this article. On the other hand, the real estate sector is expected to see the smallest price increase at 5.3% as this sector had the smallest upside difference between the bottom up target price and the closing price. That makes sense to me. I don't know about you guys. Uh, let's see. Let's continue. At the company level, the 10 stocks in the S&P 500 with the largest upside and downside differences between their median target price and closing price on December 7th can be found below here in the chart that he's got on his recent release. I know you guys can't see it, but I can see it. We'll kind of go over uh, some of this stuff later. But at the end of last year, December 31st, 2022, the bottom up target price for the S&P 500 was 4499 spot 37. Based on yesterday's closing price of 4585 4, spot 59, analysts underestimate the price of the index by 2% at the start of the of the calendar year 2023 as of yesterday, which um Today is the 11th of December, so it's a few days past. And we're trading now at about 4,600 on the S&P, so it's gone up some. However, this is a, an important point to note that the industry analysts have historically overestimated the closing price of the index at the start of the year. Over the previous 20 years, so 2003 through 2022, the average difference between the bottom-up target price estimate at the beginning of the year December 31st, and the final price for the index uh, for that same year has been 7.2%. In other words, industry analysts on average have overestimated the final price of the index by about 7.2% one year in advance during the previous 20 years. Analysts overestimate the final value. The final value finished below the estimate in 13 of the 20 years and underestimated the final value, uh, the value finished above the estimate in the other seven years. It is interesting to note that analysts have underestimated the final value in four of the past six years, 2017 through 2022. That's interesting, right? So if one applies the average overestimation of 7.2% to the current 2024 bottom-up target price estimate, assuming the estimate changes a little between now and December 31st, the expected closing value for 2024 would be like 4,705 spot 21, which is 2.6% above yesterday's closing price of 4,585 spot 59. So let's parlay that into what the price targets are for most of the major banks and investment firms and research firms. What are they saying and how are they analyzing and taking a look at the predictions for 2024? Again, these are all predictions. Hard to figure out what's actually going to happen because there's a lot of unknowns and modeling that has to happen. So take it with a grain of salt grain of salt guys all right we'll uh, we'll dive in here in just a second stay tuned all right this is what everybody's been waiting for here's a complete rundown of wall street's 2024 stock market predictions at least as of december 8th through the 11th obviously a lot of these predictions can change dependent upon where the year end finishes up and again i mentioned that uh take it with a grain of salt it's fun to think about where things might be. And also it's interesting to see the perspectives from 
uh, the larger banks and investment firms in the street. So they, they don't always get it right. They get it wrong quite a bit of the time and they have the ability to do one thing and that is change. So they can always change their view at any point in time. So keep that in mind if you're an investor. So after a, dis, uh, after a, dis, uh, after a dismal 2022, stocks soared in 23 with the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 jumping more than 20 and 50% respectively. That's like from trough to peak from 2022 to the end of 2023 today. A resilient economy, moderating inflation, and the potential peak in interest rates helped investors overcome fears of a potential recession and jump back into stocks. Now, however, I will make this point as I'm reading this Business Insider uh, perspective, which I've correlated it with a whole bunch of other sites and articles and stuff. And, and, um, and my financial analyst in, intern, Thomas Townsend, he's going to be uh, providing a little more data as I uh, uh, compile data to prepare for the state of the markets uh, release uh, by the middle to end of January, maybe the first couple weeks of February. But I do want to make this point. There's record amounts of cash sitting on the sidelines because cash gets you what treasuries get you. Uh, money markets are paying between like four and a half and five and a half percent for no risk or little to no risk. So massive amounts of cash on the sideline. Where that money is coming from is from the equity markets, but also ma from the bond market. And um, I could see a lot of that cash going to extending duration in the fixed income market or in the bonds as the Fed starts to potentially lower rates. We'll find out more about that this week, if they're going to even articulate that at all or give guidance on it at all. But um, yeah, there's there's some confluence of factors that I could see happening to cause the equity markets to do well next year. But keep in mind uh, the biggest question investors have is whether the, the strong stock market rally can continue in 2024 um, and is an economic slowdown and subsequent stock market decline or correction or crash imminent. Um, so uh, here, here, we'll just continue on with this Business Insider uh, article that they just released. Uh, they put together a complete rundown of the top Wall Street forecasts for the stock market in 2024, from economic recessions to the continuation of the bull market. Here's what Wall Street expects to have happen next year. So here we go. So BCA Research, they're bearish. Uh, S&P 500 price target of 3,300. The S&P 500 could experience its worst crash since 2008 next year as the recession kicks off, according to the 2024 outlook of BCA research. Now, they, they typically are bearish and perma, perma bears, in my opinion. Uh, they say, quote, a recession in the U.S. and euro area was delayed this year, but not avoided. Developed markets remain on a re recessionary path unless monetary policy eases very significantly. As such, the risk or reward balance is quite unfavorable for stocks, BCA research said. The stock market could avoid such a steep drawdown next year if the Federal Reserve swiftly cuts interest rates, but BCA research isn't holding its breath as they don't expect inflation to fall quickly. Quote, we remain in the disinflationary camp, but expect that inflation will not slowly uh, slow quickly enough for the Fed and the ECB to cut rates in time to prevent a significant rise in unemployment. Unless a recession occurs imminently or inflation completely collapses, the Fed is unlikely to cut rates before next summer, BCA research says. Uh, they say they go on to say that a recession next year would put the S&P 500 in the range of between 3,300 and 3,700 before an eventual rebound materializes. Now, that's actually not out of the realm of possibilities and modeling. Um, you could get a retest of the October 2022 lows, which was right around 3,500 or so. So you could see, you know, that actually happen. Um, it's not out of the realm. So keep that in mind. Is it's one of the bearish uh, perspectives on the street. J.P. Morgan is bearish. 
S&P price target of 4,200. We're right now trading at 4,600. So 400 points below where we're at now um, for next year. That's interesting. That's a very bearish view. Typically they're bullish on the market. And so uh, Marco Kalanovic and, and the rest of the crew actually have a have a contrarian view for next year because the consensus is the S&P is probably going to be at around closing at 5,000 or above. So uh, you're sitting at 4,200. That's that's significantly lower by about 800 points. So JP Morgan says high equity valuations, high interest rates and a weakening consumer, rising geopolitical risks and a potential recession give it little confidence that stocks will move higher in 2024. We expect a more challenging macro backdrop for stocks next year with softening consumer trends at a time when investor positioning and sentiment have mostly reversed. JP Morgan's Marco Kalanovic and Dubravko Lekas Bujos said in their 24 uh, uh, outlook note, equities are now richly valued with volatility near the historical low, while geopolitical and political risk remain elevated. We expect lackluster global earnings growth with downside for equities from current levels, JP Morgan said. All right, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan's cousin. They're not affiliated, but they are like cousins if you look back into their history. I used to work at JP Morgan. Uh, but Morgan Stanley is neutral, S&P 500 price target of 4,500. So again, we're trading right at that range right now. So that's interesting. Morgan Stanley expects a flat stock stock market in 2024, but sees some pockets of the stock market performing better than others. The extremely narrow leadership of the mega cap tech stocks is likely to continue early next year, but eventually break down according to the firm. Quote, the question for investors at this stage is whether the leaders can drag the laggards up to their level of of performance, or if the laggards will eventually overwhelm the leader's ability to keep delivering in this challenging macro environment, Morgan Stanley said. It, we quote, we think these dynamics are likely to persist into early 2024 before a sustainable earnings recovery takes hold. We ultimately see plus 7% earnings growth next year. Lots of hedging, I think. Morgan Stanley recommends uh, investors avoid the high price tech stocks and instead focus on defensive growth stocks typically found in healthcare utilities and consumer staple sectors, as well as late cycle cyclical stocks typically found in the industries and industrials, excuse me, industrials and energy sectors. All right. That's interesting. Um, you know, I think tech and health sciences has led for the last Oh, I don't know, 50 years, 40, 50 years. They've done very well. They do have their market cycles from calendar year to calendar year. So uh, Morgan Stanley may not be wrong. We'll see. Uh, Stiefel is neutral. S&P 500 price target of 46.50. So market strategist Barry Bannister of Stiefel expects the S&P 500 to rise in the first half of 2024 before topping out around 4650 representing potential upside of less than 2% from current levels. Uh Bannister said mega cap growth stocks will underperform relative to cyclical value stocks found in financials, energy, materials, real estate, and the Federal Reserve won't cut interest rates in the first half of the year. We expect uh a range bound S&P 500 in real terms to continue into the early 2030s. Such an environment of reflationary economic growth historically benefits value, small cap, and international equities, all by it with weaker overall S&P 500 returns than the growth-led 14.1% annualized real total return experienced in the decade of 2011 through 2021, a high level of returns that we believe is gone for a generation, Bannister said over at Stiefel. Um, I humbly disagree with this guy. Uh, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think we're in a super cycle that's going to last till 2030 in the, uh, in the markets and the U S uh, continues to show dominance globally from a business perspective. Uh, and, uh, you can, you can argue many different things about this point, but, uh, the U S is still the best place to do business uh, globally, in my opinion, anywhere 
uh, try to give me a better example of a place to do business. Uh, and, and I'll, I'll argue that all day long. All right. So Goldman Sachs is neutral S and P 500 price target of 4,700. So, uh, it's a little bit higher than where we're trading today. Again, today we're about 4,600. And so they're saying the close is 4,700 for the price target of 2024. Goldman Sachs expects the S&P 500 to finish 2024 slightly higher from the current levels as stocks are stuck in a fat and flat range since 2022. So yeah, I guess we did have a move higher. I don't disagree with a consolidation or maybe a flat year. Uh, that's not a, a bad idea. Uh, and then we go higher from there, but getting that timing right um, is, is a whole nother thing. <laughs> Uh, that's why predictions are just, are just as much as they're worth. They're nothing basically, uh, quote as higher for longer interest rates make valuation expansion from here. Difficult to justify our market forecasts are broadly in line with earnings growth on a weighted basis. We expect 8% price returns and 10% total returns for global equities over the next year, taking them towards the upper end of the fat and flat range that they have been in since 2022, Goldman Sachs said. Corporate earnings should also remain solid next year, providing a buoy to stock prices as long as a recession is averted. Boy, that's a big caveat or hedge. Quote, in the absence of a recession, corporate earnings rarely fall. Nevertheless, the lack of strong profit growth and high starting valuation, particularly in the U.S. market and low equity risk premium leaves and an unexciting outlook overall on a risk-adjusted basis relative to cash returns, Goldman Sachs said. Boy, that's a mouthful of lots of fun jargon for uh, a typical investor to understand. I mean, come on. Um, basically, they're saying they expect next year to be flat, you guys, and not to do a whole lot. Probably to go down, to go up, and then end up flat. Um, they could have just said it like that. That's a little simpler to understand. Okay, so... NDR, Ned D Davis Research, they're bullish. S&P 500 price target of 4,900. So fascinating that 200 points from Goldman Sachs from 4,700 to 4,900 of Ned, Ned Davis takes you from neutral to bullish. That is just jacked. <laughs> that is just a messed up thing because you've got Goldman that's a couple hundred points below Ned Davis, yet they're neutral. Boy, isn't that interesting and how that's written for Goldman. <laughs> oh man, this is just a joke. All right. And uh, let's see. Ned Davis says all eyes will be on the Federal Reserve throughout 2024 as Chairman Jerome Powell attempts to navigate a soft landing. NDR sees a 70% chance of that happening. Lower inflation should allow the Fed to cut rates and the 10-year Treasury to fall towards three and a half percent. A soft landing should permit the cyclical bull market to continue. Our year-end S&P target is 4,900, about 7% above current levels, NDR said. NDR expects the U.S. economy to post GDP growth of as much as 1.5% in 2024. So basically the economy not really growing that much, but barely. And added that the first half of the year could be more choppy than the second half as the presidential election gets underway. NDR recommends investors keep an eye on small cap and cyclical stocks. So they're kind of of the view that Goldman was and a few of the others. Bank, and, and JP Morgan, Bank of America uh, on, on cyclicals and, and some of the value stocks coming back. That's my point. Bank of America bullish, uh, S&P 500 price target of 5,000. Uh, Bank of America is bullish on the stock market in 2024 because of how much progress the Federal Reserve has made towards tightening its monetary policy following more than a year of aggressive interest rate hikes and the ongoing reduction of its balance sheet. Quote, we're bullish not because we expect the Fed to cut, but because of what the Fed has accomplished. Companies have adopted higher rates and inflation. Bank of America's uh, Savita Sabranaman said in her 2024 Outlook note. It also helps that investors remain laser focused on a potential economic recession and is focusing more on the bad news than the good news. Quote, we are past maximum macro uncertainty. 
The market has absorbed significant geopolitical shocks already, and the good news is we're talking about the bad news, Bank of America said in their note. I agree with that, too. I think that we've been pessimistic and we've climbed the wall of worry, and that's only going to get harder in 2024. There's going to be all these concerns and worries, yet the market's going to be resilient and grind higher, especially if the Fed lowers rates. If they set guidance and lower rates and we see inflation data come down and wage inflation come down, and then you get a shift in political power towards a more pro-business stance and pro-America stance in the, in the place of the world, you're going to see the market respond well. That's what should happen, at least from my point of view. Now, well, I just have an opinion that I just made known, and it's just interesting, I think, how people are pessimistic, and the, they were pessimistic at the beginning of last year, and the market went higher. So here we go. We'll continue on. RBC, all right? So uh, let's see. They're bullish. S&P 500 price target of 5,000. So what, here's what they say. The stock market's strong 9% rally in November may have pulled forward some of 2024's potential gains, but there's still further upside ahead, according to RBC's 2024 outlook. The main driver behind the expected gains next year could be a continued decline in the inflation rate. Implicit in our valuation model is the idea that continued moderation in inflation can do most of the heavy lifting to prop up the PE multiple price to earnings multiple, you guys. Something our analysts suggest happened back in the 1970s, RBC said. This model has been the most constructive one in our arsenal on the 2023 forecast and may very well end up being the most accurate if Santa shows up in December instead of the Grinch. And that's obviously happening, guys. Right now, the the, the Santa Claus rally is happening. The Canadian bank, so... RBC is the Royal Bank of Canada. The Canadian bank added that while the 2024 presidential, uh, presidential election could add uncertainty to the markets, the SP saw an average gain of around 7.5% in presidential election cycles. I agree with that. Historical data shows that the markets are up uh, heading into that. So what this stat tells us is that any given presidential election year is a source of uncertainty for the U.S. equity market, given all the unusual aspects of the 2024 contest. That seems like an appropriate way to think about the political backdrop for stocks in 2024, RBC said. So that's a Canadian bank giving a perspective on the U.S. markets. Federated Hermes, they're a huge asset manager. They're bullish. S&P 500 price target of 5000 Strong underlying trends in the stock market are likely to extend well into 2024, according to Federated Hermes Chief Equity Strategist Phil Orlando. We, quote, think that stocks are going to grind higher. They've gone from 4,100 to 4,500, and we think that's a trend that's got legs, Orlando said last month. So that was in November. Orlando chalked up his bullishness to his belief that the Federal Reserve is done hiking rates given inflation has cooled considerably from its peak. So they're pointing to the rates and inflation uh, story. So the bond market's done the heavy lifting for the Fed since last Fed rate hike in July. That gives the Fed the luxury, in my view, to step back and say, you know what? We don't have to hike anymore. We can just sit here on the sidelines for the next year and allow the gradual slowing of inflation to uh occur. So the rate of change of inflation and then a reversal of that coming down. Deutsche Bank is bullish S&P 500 price target of 5,100. So Deutsche Bank is bullish. The U.S. economy is approaching a soft landing as inflation cools and GDP growth remains solid. And that's a great scenario for the stock market, according to Deutsche Bank's 2024 stock market outlook. And even if an economic recession does materialize in 24. It shouldn't impact the stock prices dramatically because most investors are anticipating it, the bank said. The bank expects the S&P 500 to rise about 10% in 2024 to 5,100. And if the economy dodges a recession, so there's that hedge again, if they dodge a recession, the gains could nearly double to about 19% in its bull case scenario. So just so you guys know, most of these banks and investment firms have multiple models, multiple scenarios. All right, BMO, uh, BMO Harris or BMO, 
They're bullish. S&P 500 price target of 5,100. So the stock market will deliver another year of solid gains in 2024 as the second year of the bull market gets underway, even if an economic recession materializes. So again, they point to even if there is a recession, they're still bullish. Falling inflation, falling interest rates, a strong job market, and rising corporate earnings are tailwinds that will drive further upside in the stock market next year, according to BMO. U.S. stock market performance and fundamentals in 2023, followed by the script, in our view, to lay out the foundation that we uh, and what we continue to believe will be a path of normalcy for earnings growth, valuation trends, price performance is like to un- likely to unfold over the next three to five years, BMO said in their note. Uh, I like that. I, I just love the idea of it being bullish. Now, uh, fund strat bullish S and P 500 price target of 5,200. So they're, they're the most bullish on the street. So, uh, fund strats, Tom Lee, which I like him. I like what he says. Uh, he, he's a thinker. His S and P price target, uh, 5,200 represents gains of about 14% from current levels. Lee said the most of the gains are likely to come in the second half of the year. Uh, as the Federal Reserve shifts from inflation war to business cycle management. That means interest rate cuts are more likely next year. Meanwhile, the economy should be on solid footing. Pent-up demand suggests that we are more early cycle, not late cycle, Lee said, and that as investors wake up to that fact, evidenced by continued resilience in corporate earnings and solid consumer spending, they should start to buy stocks. Again, I want to mention that there's a lot of money on the sideline in cash uh, that ha- needs to go somewhere, whether that's in the fixed income market or into the equity market. Um, that remains to be seen, and we'll see how those in- those fund flows happen. Investors, he said, uh, allocate into equities, particularly retail investors who withdrew $240 billion in 2023, he added. We expect equities to surprise consensus to the upside in 2024, delivering 12% to 15% returns. Wouldn't that be nice? All right. Cause you know, whatever you're sitting in, in treasuries, you're earning five, five, four and a half to five and a half, maybe a little higher depending on where you're at, but that would be nice to also get 12 to 15% in equities while your cash allocation or your fixed income allocation is doing well in the face of lowering rates by the Federal Reserve. It's a it's a nice scenario to think about. Well, we just went through quite a bit. Um, there is more to go over and I don't have the time to do it on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Like and subscribe the Northbound Wealth Podcast. And uh, we'll keep bringing some information, insights uh, to you as we move through the end of this year. I got one more podcast release. Uh, give us a call at 317-399-1107 if you have any questions or would like us to review your portfolio and uh, talk about what the markets bring in 2024.